Dr. Roger Lanius is our is Roger. principal at Lanius Historical Services. A distinguished author on aerospace history, Dr. Lanius recently penned Historical Analogs for the Stimulation of Space Commerce and Space Shuttle Legacy, How We Did It and What We Learned. He served as a consultant to the Columbia Accident Investigation Board and presented the prestigious Harmon Memorial Lecture on the History of National Security Space Policy at the U.S. Air Force Academy. Dr. Lanius frequently comments on aerospace issues in electronic and print news media, as well as on NPR and all the major television network news programs. Dr. Lanius, thank you for being here today. This screen is yours. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. I do have some slides which I will, uh, which I will show you, assuming I can figure out how to do that. It's the bottom right hand corner says present now. I see it. And let's see if I can. Uh, usually it's it's uh, a window. You've got three options. Uh, while you're it doing is indeed. That, I've got it. Good. While you're doing that, I just want to let everybody know that um, uh, Dr. Lanius' uh, paper that he's uh, going to be referencing is is live on the Blue Marble Week website. I'll post a link to it in just a moment. It's all you. Well, hi, everybody. I, I am Roger Lanius. I uh, spent a number of years working as a historian in various federal organizations uh, associated with air and space uh, for a time with the U.S. Air Force, but beginning in 1990 as the NASA chief historian until I left there in 2002 to move to the National Air and Space Museum at, that's a part of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. I hope that many of you have had the opportunity to visit that museum, and if you have not, that you will make it a priority uh, sometime in the not too distant future. It's one of the greatest places to go. Uh, it is, as far as I'm con concerned, a cathedral to air and space, and uh, is a place that is uh, uh, is remarkable for all of the things to see and do while you're there. So that's my uh, unabashed plug for my institution. I retired a few years ago, and I'm now in Auburn, Alabama, but, uh, but I remain active in these areas. Uh, as was mentioned, I, a few years ago, I, I did a monograph that is available uh, online, if anyone wants to read it, that looks at historical an analogs, analogies, if you will, uh, in terms of public-private partnerships. And we've heard a lot of talk this morning about those, and and, and Andy Aldrin just uh, made a lot of comments about them uh, uh, with much more detail than I could ever provide. But, uh, but they are uh, a, a useful way to look at how we might do, uh, do things in space. And what I did was go back in history, American history, because that's the area that I'm interested in, and, uh, and focus on how analogs have been used previously. Public-private partnerships go back to the very beginning of the United States. Uh, they come in all shapes and sizes. They uh, have a variety of features. All of them, at, at some, are uh, some sort of, of relationship, formal relationship between a government entity or entities uh, and private sector activities of some type or another, maybe multiple, maybe, maybe one. But nonetheless, they, uh, they are simply that. So uh, there's been a lot of things that have been done in U.S. history to sort of develop areas that I think have some application when we're thinking about space utilization and space commercialization. Uh, I looked at about a half a dozen different areas uh, in this monograph. I'm only going to talk about four of them and only briefly. But, um, but the first one and one that people focus on almost immediately is the railroads of the 19th century. Uh, so, you know, the steam engine becomes a reality just before the turn of the 19th century. It is, uh, uh, it, it is central to the development of the uh, Industrial Revolution. Uh, and, of course, it gets harnessed for transportation purposes, both on steamboats as well as railroads. And there are a few steam cars, too, a little later on. But nonetheless, um, largely on land, it's it's mostly about the railroads. And it became obvious to um, 
American governmental officials at all levels, uh, from the national level to the state to the local, that this is an important technology and it needs to be fostered uh, for all kinds of purposes. And, and there's very specific reasons for wanting to do this. It all has to do with, uh, with commercial activities and with the advance of commercial activities across the board, whether it be industry or, or whatever else. So um, the railroads could have taken a variety of forms and they took almost every form you can imagine depending upon the individual system. The first railroad built in the United States was 100% government activity, uh, built in 1830 in South Carolina. Um, and, and it was a, 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 a small set, only about 30 miles of track, but nonetheless, uh, it, it was done at the behest of the state government. And uh, state and local entities contracted with private firms to build this and operate it for the benefit of the state as a whole. That's one model. That's government ownership. That's less public private partnership than, than it is just a contracting process that we are familiar with from a lot of space activities that we've seen. Uh, when they developed the Transcontinental Railroad in the, in the 1850s, 1860s, uh, the federal government took a different approach. Congress had, had control of this and they basically made the decision, we're only going to do what is necessary to foster this and nothing more. So, uh, uh, so the process was really about stimulating uh, private sector investment to undertake these areas. One of the things that they had was a vast amount of, of public land owned in the American West. And so uh, by granting land to these transcontinental railroad builders that they could then use for whatever purpose they chose uh, was a big stimulus to enable them to, uh, to build the Transcontinental Railroad. The first one, the picture that you can see here, uh, is at uh, Promontory Point, Utah in 1869, where the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific Railroad, ra Railroads linked up uh, sort of in the middle of the Great Basin uh, to create the first Transcontinental Railroad in the US. It was a useful model, it worked very well. There has been a lot of public-private partnership since that time uh, for the building and operation of railroads as well. Some of those public-private partnerships, I will just add before I move on to the next area, had to do with Native American uh, entities uh, on, on, on tribal lands in which the tribe itself was involved in the public-private partnership uh, to stimulate, once again, transportation into and through uh, their parts of the American West. That turned into a really interesting story in a lot of different ways, uh, but it was a successful public-private partnership. And so was this other one about the Transcontinental Railroad. So a question to ask is, can we develop, say, and I'm focused here basically on the moon, a lunar transportation corridor that has public-private components to it? And the answer to that, of course, you can. The question, you know, the next question is, what form does it take and there is all kinds of possibilities. You know, can, uh, can you entice angels to do things for you? Uh, can the government provide grants? There's no land to grant, like was the case with the Transcontinental Railroad, but there may be other things, uh, patents, uh, other types of fees that might be uh, uh, turned into this guarantee of, of a certain level of support after the the transportation corridor is created. Uh, other things of value that might be granted to the entities that undertake these. Uh, and, and that may be as simple as things like spectrum that have to do with, uh, with uh, transportation or movement of data and, um, uh, and voice uh, to various places in this transportation corridor. There's a, a variety of possibilities, but the jury is out on how you might do this. Some of you may have thought through this in great detail and come up with good plans, and I would defer to you on those issues, but that is one way to approach it. But the second area that I love to talk about is the, is the commercial aviation industry and the larger sort of space transportation industry. So in 1903, the Wright brothers flew the first airplane 
at, in Kitty Hawk. You can see the picture here, one of the most famous images taken in the 19th, in, in the 20th century. And, uh, uh, and clearly, uh, it, it was known immediately that this was going to be a major uh, activity that would be engaged in by a variety of entities. Uh, and the government had a specific interest in this, largely for military purposes initially, but also for other kinds of purposes. And very early on, uh, the, uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, Postal Service said, you know, we, can, we, we have constantly been trying to figure out how we can speed the delivery of mail. And uh, especially from the eastern part of the United States to the western part of the United States. And they weren't interested in letters that were being sent from a family member in San Francisco to a family member in New York as much as they were the banking industry and the transportation of information that was necessary for commercial purposes. And the, every hour that you can cut in terms of that delivery uh, system uh, is money to be made. And so uh, the Postal Service sponsored very early on from, from the beginning of World War I, really efforts to advance um, mail delivery by airplanes. And initially those were 100% government owned and operated. Uh, the airplanes, the pilots were government employees, uh, the, the, the system that was put in place to do the transportation, the, the, uh, the airports uh, were government entities. Did it have to be that way? It didn't. And by the 1920s, there was a concerted effort inside of Congress to turn this into a commercial industry. Uh, and, and that was a fostering of it. There were other things that were done as well. Uh, but some of them had to do with uh, national security, obviously. Some of them had to do with economic competitiveness. Some of them were just about pride and prejudice, prestige, because obviously, uh, if you can fly transcontinental without stopping, for instance, that's a big deal. If you can fly across the Atlantic, that's a big deal. And there was a lot of support for that. And of course, we all know the story of Charles Lindbergh in 1927, who flew the transatlantic flight uh, without stopping between the United States and France. Uh, he did it as a private sector activity, but there was a whole lot of government support behind the scenes, which most people don't know about, all the way from technology development from the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the predecessor to NASA, uh, to the Weather Service and what they were doing to help make this happen, uh, to the Navy supporting activities, tracking him over the Atlantic Ocean. All of those were a part of government activities investing in this particular fundamental activity. So commercial aviation has been fostered through a variety of entities. We now think of it as pretty much 100% uh, uh, private sector. And of course, it's not by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, obviously, there are federal agencies dedicated uh, to ensuring the safety of airplanes, uh, to controlling the skies, to, um, to developing technologies necessary to advance these activities. And, uh, and those are indirect investments, but nonetheless significant investments. It could go on and on from there, but let me leave it at that. Um, I, some of the same things that I've already just said is on this particular slide, so I won't go into this. Port authorities that were public-private partnerships in various cities uh, built many of the airports that we now uh, use today and are operated in, in a public-private partnership that may be successful or not successful depending upon how it's constructed and, and operated, but nonetheless are very real. So can we have a commercial space line industry? And I think we're already beginning to see that. The, uh, the reality is that... Uh, one of the things that, and NASA was brought kicking and screaming into this uh, through the fostering of, of commercial space access activities, you know, right at the beginning of the 21st century, which has yielded fruit uh, in the last decade uh, as SpaceX, Orbital Sciences, then Orbital ATK, now part of, of, of Northrop Grumman, uh, have successfully developed uh, 
commercial support systems to, uh, to resupply the space station and, of course, just last year with SpaceX to ferry astronauts to and from the space station. Uh, and, and that has been a pretty remarkable activity. One of the things that has always struck me about low Earth orbit, uh, when I was a kid, I'm old enough to remember this, when I was a kid, I watched 2001 A Space Odyssey, and I thought it was such a marvelous film in so many ways. And uh, yes, it had to do with a, a, a mission to Jupiter and an encounter with alien intelligence and all that sort of thing. But what was most interesting to me was the activities in Earth orbit. So uh, there's a launch of a commercial space plane uh, that's operated by Pan American in those days on the, on the film, uh, which was a commercial carrier, very important in the United States uh, for uh, aviation history, uh, that launches from Earth and goes to a space station. When you get to that space station, many of the entities that are there are commercial. Uh, the hero of the, of the first part of the film, film uh, calls back to home on an AT&T phone. Uh, he goes to a Howard Johnson's, which mostly don't exist anymore, but that was a pretty, pretty important restaurant chain uh, at that point in time, and, and is, in, is engaged in commercial activities in low Earth orbit. When he goes on to the moon, that is a government entity. It is an outpost that is operated by, uh, by in this case, the American government. The, um, and, and that suggests that low Earth orbit had become a normal realm of human activity in this particular film. And what we've seen happen in the last two decades is that is more and more happening in real life. NASA has pushed back the frontiers of understanding about low Earth orbit. It's no longer an adventure to go there. We know what to expect. We have the technologies. We know how to develop more technologies. And we know how to use this activity or this particular realm to do things that are useful to us. And more and more of those activities in the future, I think, are going to be commercial. And I would like to think, probably everybody else agrees, uh, that would free NASA up to do exploration, which is what I would really love to see it undertake. My third area to look at is sort of uh, the lunar base. Uh, you know, would it look like a base that's in Antarctica? I think there's a so a lot of similarities between Antarctica and the difficulties we've had there and the way in which it is governed than, uh, and what we might see happening on the moon in the future. Um, and I fully believe that we have it within our capability within the next 10 to 15 years, if we choose to do it, to establish a base on the moon somewhere, sort of a McMurdo station on the moon. It would probably look a lot like Antarctica. It would probably a, a, be a governmental functioning base uh, with people cycle in and out, uh, scientists, engineers, other technical types of people doing the things that they want to do there uh, that would build a, a support structure necessary to sort of expand activities uh, to the moon. And I think that's possible to do. I think it'll look a lot like Antarctica, and I think our model is what we should think of when we think of the American bases that exist there today. So the Antarctic bases were established, the permanent ones were established at the time of the International Geophysical Year in 1957 and 58. The Americans put them in, There's one at the South Pole, McMurdo Station is the one that's on the coast. Uh, there are others that are located in other places uh, in Antarctica. And, um, and they have been maintained there for scientific purposes. It is extreme environment research, no question about that. The moon would be a similar extreme environment, uh, even more extreme than what we're used to with, with uh, Antarctica. It's all overseen by a UN International Consortium. I do think that that's a, a, a model for governance on the moon as well. Uh, but support of the base 
uh, on the moon and the ones in, in, uh, that the Americans undertake in Antarctica are done under contract uh, to the National Science Foundation, sometimes with the Navy uh, and the Department of Defense. And uh, that is probably, I think, a model that we will see moving forward for a lunar base. So is there a Mer Myrtle station on the moon in the offing? I actually think there probably is. Uh, there's a variety of ways in which it might be developed. All the details are fluid. Uh, they can be struck in whatever way uh, the entities that are undertaking negotiations would do so. And it is all about negotiation. Uh, I agree with uh, some of the comments I heard earlier today about the International Space Station. When historians 100 years from now look back on the International Space Station as a, a moment in time, and of course the station will be abandoned at some point, probably deorbited, um, and no longer exist, that, that the, the fundamental takeaway will be not the science done, although the science has been significant. It'll be the international consortium that undertook that and how it was put together in the 1980s under NASA's leadership to build, and this was all pre uh, uh, involvement of the Russians in the program while the Soviet Union was still in existence, the Cold War was still on. And, um, and they were not a part of the program at that particular point in time, but American allies were, and it's the same entities that are today. You know, it's, it, 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 was, it was Canada, it was the Europeans, it was Japan, it was some other entities that have come aboard board since that time uh, that undertook this activity. And holding that together for the lifetime of this space station has been a remarkable feat in which a, an international effort, not about war, not about killing people and breaking things, has been able to be sustained over such a long period with, with the ebbs and flows of international relations and difficulties. I just think it, it is one of the most remarkable feats that we've seen in space, uh, certainly since the moon landings. And, um, and I think that that's the future going forward as well. And that any sort of base on the moon, any sort of activity there will be a consortium, should be international, should be public-private, and, uh, and should involve all the nations that uh, want to be a part of the deal and are willing to agree to the rules that are put into place by the leaders in this. And by the way, let me just add one thing. I think the United States should lead the charge. And if it does not do so, somebody else will pick up the baton. No question about that. Okay, my last area that I want to talk about uh, is, um, is the issue of, of tourism. And, uh, and I'm struck by the national park experience there because I think that's a model going forward. Uh, so in 1916, Congress created the National Park Service. Now there had been national parks established prior to that time, but they were sort of one-offs and managed in that particular way. This brought them all together. And, um, and the intent was to conserve our great natural and historic resources. Uh, and, and you see the quote on the slide, by such means as will leave them unimpaired. Nobody had a full understanding of what the park system would become, but it is so critical to our lives today that I can't envision a world in which they don't exist. Uh, we can go all over the, all over the country, and obviously other nations have, have uh, done similar sorts of things and created these pristine environments in which we can engage in uh, wondrous outdoor activities. And there weren't any rules put in place for how the park leadership would undertake this particular development. They realized, though, that they wanted to have tourists, that it was important that that be a central feature of this activity. I mean, having a wilderness area doesn't mean a whole lot unless you can go there and experience it. But you also then have to, to, to maintain 
something of its pristine character. So how do you do that in a way that makes sense? And their approach was to create a series of public-private partnerships. Uh, the first thing they did was work with the railroads to develop transportation systems into the park boundaries. Uh, and later on, highway systems to do that. Uh, so that you can actually get there because ease of movement is a key feature of tourism. Uh, they then worked with concessionaires uh, to, to build hotels. You can see a picture of the Glacier Hotel built by the, NAC, by the Great uh, Northern Railroad uh, as a place for tourists to gather just, just to, at, the, at the park boundary. And then from there, they could go in and do various things inside the park itself. And over time, this has expanded. It has become broader. It has become a moneymaker for pretty much everybody involved in the efforts. Um, and generally speaking, have been viewed as a, a great feature moving forward. Uh, so this is my last slide. Can we have a set of public-private partnerships, and, uh, and how might they be structured to advance activities going to the moon? We could talk about Mars, we could talk about other things, but I think the moon is uh, the one target, personally, I'm most interested in, but more important than that, uh, is one that's reachable and doable in a lot of different ways. So with that, let me, uh, let me end my comments. I will take uh, any questions anybody wants to, wants to provide, or if you want to take uh, exception to anything I have to say, I'm happy to debate that too. So let me stop this, the screen sharing. And uh, bring my smiling face back up. Okay. Um, Roger, thank uh, you. Thank you so much for uh, summarizing your book. There are some key points in your book. Uh, really appreciate it and very germane to the discussion we're having here. Um, in your book, you talk about the uses and abuses of uh, analogies in this type of approach. And I'd be curious, you've given some great examples. Can you pick three key aspects that should be included in any public-private partnership design that would be appropriate for space? <laughs> well, I, you know, obviously there needs to be a meaningful role for, for the private sector. Uh, there um, certainly needs to be a meaningful role for the government and, they, and it has to be advantageous to both or you don't have an agreement. And, uh, and, and a core question is, what is advantageous at any point in time? And, um, and then I guess the second piece is, the intention would be that these would be long-standing, uh, that they, they may be subject to renewal and modification, but uh, once you strike a deal, you would like to have that deal sort of be in place to carry out the activities. And if you're, if you're talking about something like a lunar base, um, well, that's something that, that you're going to establish, build on, uh, modify, extend, do all of those sorts of things, but not end. Right. And, uh, and in that sense, um, keeping it together over a long period of time, this is where the, where the story of the International Space Station, I think, is remarkable, because how, they, how the partners have kept that together, I mean, you know, we're not worthy, quite frankly. <laughs> uh, it, it is, a, uh, it is a, a, a truly remarkable story. And in spite of all the machinations, and all the difficulties that have um, that that the partners have had, and, they, and they've had knockdown dragouts. There, there have been uh, events on the station where there's been sort of confrontation, yeah, and uh, <clears throat> not armed confrontation or anything like that, but but nonetheless arguments about how they were going to conduct business. Uh, but they've been able to work through all of that, and. You know, some of the toughest problems have been with uh, the Americans and the Russians. Um, and at the time that the, the Crimea uh, issue arose a few years ago, uh, the head of the Russian Space Agency at that point 
uh, NASA was relying upon them and Soyuz capsules to get astronauts to the space station. He sort of made a comment, probably flippantly, but there was a bit of a threat there that was, well, you know, if you guys don't like what's going on, maybe you should just use a trampoline to get to the ISS. And um, I, it's a funny, <laughs> it's a funny statement. He probably wasn't serious, but we sort of have to pause and think about that. What if they had canceled the agreements? My goodness, what would have happened? If we couldn't resupply the station, um, if we couldn't bring astronauts up and down, uh, we just have to abandon the thing and leave it to somebody else. Could have been serious. Anyway. Talk about the, you talked about the airline industry uh, and the, its roots um, and the prestige and pride piece of it. Um, how that was an important driver of getting the political will behind a public-private mm -hmm. partnership. Do you think in today's environment, and we have, I think, 11 senators um, and maybe 35 congressmen uh, interested in our bill, do you think that the political will is there or that we will wait again until we're behind before we'll really uh, be able to get something like this in place? Well, I, I yeah, I'd like to think we'll be proactive, um, but I'm not sanguine that we will be. Yeah. The, um, the, the reality is we, uh, everybody knows the story of the tortoise and the hare. Well, America has always been the hare. When things are going well for us, we sort of rest on our laurels and we don't think too much about it. When there's a crisis, whatever that crisis might be, uh, we step up and, and, and we show the innovation that is so much a part of our culture and we make decisions and we make sacrifices and we, and we accomplish what we need to accomplish. But as soon as we're sort of back in the, uh, you know, we sort of then get fat, dumb, and happy and sit here and not worry about it too much. So I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, what you did. Um, the, you know, the, the airline industry is a great story in a lot of ways. I mean, we invented the airplane. So take some pride in that. But by, but by 1910, the technology advance had moved to Europe. And, you know, we're still flying not much beyond the right flyer here. Uh, and they're flying airplanes that can go quite a bit faster, quite a bit higher, quite a bit farther and have more maneuverability. And you can do all these other things. We can do any of that. And it became obvious by World War I, by 1914, that the world had passed us by. And we had to do something about that. The NACA, NASA's predecessor, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, was established in 1915, and there's no accident. It's because of what we saw happening in Europe. We have got to catch up, and the way to do that is to create a research institution that will advance the technology that we need for flight. And we're willing to spend whatever it takes to do that. Now, the reality was that investment was not that great. Um, uh, but it had profound impact and really changed the nature of things. After the war, we sort of went back to our old ways, and it took another big jolt to change that uh, in the 1930s. There is a great story, and you stop me when I bore you, because, uh, <laughs> because I can do this all day. Uh, there's That's a great why we have story. you here. <laughs> there's a great story in 1936 in which uh, the heads of several entities associated with aviation in the United States, especially the NACA leadership, went to Germany uh, to, to, at the invitation of the, of the German government to visit their aircraft activities to see what they were doing. So they got over there uh, and and they saw new wind tunnels that had been built for research purposes. They saw the airplanes that were on the drawing pa pads and in some cases on the flight lines already. 
and they came back scared to death. My God, look at what these people can do. And we can't do any of that. And it's at that point that they began to, you know, sound the alarm and, 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 and bang the drum that we've got to put some investment into this to the point that by 1938, this is still, you know, the World War II begins in 1939. We don't get involved until the end of 1941, but, you know, the Germans invade Poland in 1939. That begins World War I, or World War II. And, um, and at the time that that happened, our Air Force ranked 47th in the world in terms of number of airplanes and capability. And, and Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, the president's running around saying, we've got to do something about that. We need to build 50,000 new airplanes. And Congress is looking at him going, are you insane? We can't do that. Well, of course we can. And they did. Uh, but it took some time. But it wasn't until we saw what was taking place and uh, that we begin to catch up. And it's happened over and over again. I mean, we were surprised by the Russians with Sputnik. We were surprised by the Russians with Gagarin. Uh, and then we got our act together and went to the moon. And then what did we do? <laughs> Waited. Yes. Can you, you know, since you're talking about the NACA and the, that, the, the development there, can you just give a, a moment on what is it? I think it's six months or nine months between Sputnik launch and then the creation of NASA and the creation of what is now DARPA. Uh, can you just kind of like, because we, we reacted to that very quickly, right? So can you just kind of talk about the history of those, those elements? Sure. So the, the only thing we can compare that to that's happened in sort of the lifetimes of the people that are here, well, maybe some of the folks weren't alive yet, is 9-11. Okay. Um, you know, that's a similar level of crisis that, that we experienced. And, uh, and, and everybody knew it was a crisis. Uh, it, 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 at some level, it was partly manufactured for political purposes because, uh, you know, Lyndon Johnson, who was the leader of the Senate at the time, a Democrat, Eisenhower, a Republican, was in the White House, is running around talking about how if the Soviets can put a satellite over our heads, Sputnik 1, they can bring a nuclear weapon down on our heads. Well, first off, that's those of you who are technical people know that that's not exactly the same thing. Uh, it, it's related, but it's not the same thing. And, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, he beat the drum as loud as he could. He was helped by lots of other people. Um, some did so and took the high road. Some didn't take the high road. My personal favorite is the low road that was taken uh, by the governor of, of Michigan in the aftermath of, of uh, Sputnik, who coined a little ditty uh, to make fun of Eisenhower on this. And, and it goes, oh, little Sputnik flying high with made in Moscow beep. You tell the world it's a commie sky and Uncle Sam's asleep. And it goes on and on. There's like 40 verses. <laughs> they become more and more crude. Um, there's all kinds of allusions to things that we probably shouldn't talk about. And, uh, and anyway, the, uh, the result of that uh, was that everybody ran around. By the end of the year of 1957, and, and, and I should tell you, it's not just Sputnik 1 that is an issue. Sputnik 2 was launched on November 3rd of 1957, not quite a month later. Oh, yeah. And then the Americans decide they're going to respond by trying to launch their Vanguard, their Vanguard satellite on December uh, of 1957 and invited everybody to the launch. And it was the most beautiful explosion you've ever seen. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the newspapers had a field day with it. They referred to it as Flopnik, Kaputnik, <laughs> all kinds of things. And the result of that was it wasn't just one strike. It's three strikes. We had to do something. By the end of the year, everybody knew we had to create an entity that was going to pursue this. And, uh, and NASA is the result of that. But it's not just NASA. You mentioned DARPA. Um, uh, and it was, it was called... 
ARPA in those days didn't have the D on, on the beginning. It doesn't matter. It's the same entity. That could be done with an executive order, and it was. Um, there were other things done with an executive order, creation of a, spa uh, of a, of a, of a, a presidential science advisor and a presidential science advisory committee inside the White House to oversee these activities, the passage in, uh, in the first part of 1958 of the Defense um, Education Act, which put all kinds of funding into uh, especially, well, I mean, we all know it by STEM. That's what it was. Uh, graduate and undergraduate education in science and engineering and math. Um, and then it, that expanded into K through 12. There are, you talk to anybody who was educated in the technical world in the 1960s, and they will tell you that they got some of their funding from, uh, from the National Defense Education Act, the NDEA, uh, which ran for many years thereafter. Uh, and we need another thing like that today, in my mind. Uh, everybody, everybody runs around with their hair on fire about how we're not training enough scientists and engineers. I don't disagree that we don't, that we're not tra training enough. But if you, if you see a problem, how do you solve it? And the answer to that is train more. And the way to do that is put money into it. <laughs> That's great. You're talking about training STEM professionals. There, there's also been a history of engaging in some of the stories, engaging unexpected workforce sources. Um, you know, the building of those planes uh, included women for the for, for one of the first professions women could come into. Let's try to bring Scranton, Pennsylvania, in uh, home of the Rail Riders minor league baseball team. You've got your <laughs> baseball picture up there. Um, Talk a little bit about how the space, if we were to do a public-private partnership, how will the space industry's growth be able to leverage workforce contributions from unexpected places? Yeah, you know, one of the things that is remarkable about, and we're talking about building hardware here, uh, is that, you know, there's, there's obviously people who are employed by the corporations who are the prime contractors on whatever, building a rocket or something. They, build, they work for SpaceX or Boeing or whoever it happens to be. Uh, and, and that's one community. And, uh, and, and those human resources people at those corporations understand exactly the type of skill sets that they need to do that work. Um, and, and so I'll defer to them. But there's all these sub suppliers of everything you can imagine. Uh, you know, everything from the bolts that you use to put together two pieces of metal that are going to go on to a, go into a rocket in some particular way. And that company may be far, far removed from what they think of as the space industry. And, um, and, and so if you've got somebody who's manufacturing nuts and bolts for some sort of construction project here, they need to make nuts and bolts to a higher specification, probably with different materials uh, for space activities. And, uh, and how do you talk to those corporations about the kinds of needs that they have? Because they probably won't do much until they actually have a contract. Uh, and, uh, and maybe they should be a little more proactive. Can you make them more so? And then of course, I'm a, I'm a historian, so let me just speak to the uh, to those areas, the social sciences. And um, I never could handle the math. I've told people this over the years. If I could have handled the math, I would have been one of you all. But, um, uh, but you know, I, I, I found a different path. And those, those paths are real. Um, so what are the things that are needed along those areas? I... I, I, I'll draw from my own experience. When I was in graduate school, uh, and I heard somebody mention that they went to LSU, so did I. That's where I got my PhD. Um, and I worked for a company that did offshore survey operations in the Gulf of Mexico as a radio operator. <laughs> I'm oiling gas. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you probably know the company. But anyway, 
Uh, I won't. I won't embarrass Sam by having me as an employee at one point. But um, uh, anyway, I was a radio operator, and um, and one of the things they asked me, and mostly that's a lot of sitting and waiting. You know, when communications come in, that's fine. But but uh, when they don't, you're just sort of sitting there at the radio, and uh, and so I was bored, and I could do some study there, and that was great. But then I started looking at technical reports. And for every pipeline that they surveyed, the underwater pipeline, uh, they had to write reports. And those reports were, I mean, it was like stereo instructions. I mean, you could not understand them. And I'm not just talking about the equations and things like that, which obviously they need to do all that, but just basic communication skills. So every company needs that capability. That's, that's me, that's what I do. And, um, uh, and, 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 and the English literature major and, you know, whoever else there is that's, that's in the softer areas and social sciences, they can do that kind of work. Um, and good Lord, we know, I know we need them having read enough of these reports. Great answer. I, I want to call attention to a question that was in the chat. That's so good. I wish I'd come up with it. <laughs> um, it is that you've come up with largely positive examples of frameworks in the past of public-private partnerships that have worked really well. Are there any examples of failures, dramatic failures, uh, that you can share with us as uh, caveats? Oh, sure. I mean, there's tons of them. And, and I talk about them in the, manu in, in the monograph a bit uh, in some areas. I mean, the railroads, that's a very broad area. There's, there's lots of railroads built. I focused on the transcontinental railroad, but there's lots of others, some of which absolutely fundamentally just utterly fail. And, um, and some of it was just stupidity. Um, some of it was overreach. Some of it was undercapitalization. Some of it was a failure to sort of, uh, uh, of uh, understanding the problem per se and focusing on that. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it was, and mostly I have to admit that uh, it's sort of the, on the government side, the government just sort of gets bored and backs out, leaving everybody high and dry and somebody who's got a railroad. By the way, railroad's no good unless it actually goes to where it's supposed to go. So you get one half built and then you cut the funding, sort of presents a problem and everybody loses their shirt. That's just one example. Um, I'll give you one that's more specific to space. Uh, in 1994, NASA uh, created a public-private partnership with Lockheed um, to develop and build the X-33, uh, which was in, in, intended at the time as a, as a technology demonstrator that would lead to a private sector space plane called VentureStar. And um, NASA thought they could do this for a song. But they did promise one and a half billion dollars, which is chicken feed. You, you, you want to build a space plane that can go to and from Earth orbit? That's not, doesn't have stages and all the other stuff? I mean, come on. And um, especially in 1995, 1994, 95. The um, uh, Boeing, I'm sorry, Lockheed agreed to put in about a billion dollars as well. That was the official things. Of course, probably they both put in more, but not enough more. They ran into technological problems um, over composite tanks, uh, over the thermal protection system. There were obviously other problems, but those are the two biggies uh, that everybody talked about at the time. And, uh, and NASA got cold feet. Uh, the question that everybody, when they pulled the plug, I think it was 2001, uh, on this particular project, they had invested all of that money. It was sunk cost. Um, and the question I asked at the time without ever getting a good answer, maybe somebody knows the answer, is what would it have taken to solve the technical problems? I mean, obviously, if you're throwing good money after bad, that's, you want to, you want to cut your losses, but uh, you know, can you solve that composite tank problem for another hundred million, two hundred million, three hundred million? If you can, is it worth it? 
Um, and clearly NASA decided it was not, but in talking to people working in the program, what they fundamentally didn't want to do is have to go to Congress and explain themselves. Uh, and it would be an embarrassment. Uh, so they, they, they cut the program. I still think it's a mistake. Uh, that, that project, uh, the technologies out of it found their way into other projects down the road and have been quite useful in a lot of ways, but uh, they never built the X-33. Yeah, wonderful examples. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. We'd love for you to stay on for our breakout groups.